how to keep a population of 2.2 million people alive that is completely cut off from deliveries of food and fuel via road, rail and waterways. You just supply them with everything by plane. This is exactly what happened to West Berlin in 1948. I'm talking about the Berlin Airlift. Hi and welcome to another East Germany Investigated video. Today we're going to make a little excursion to the period just before East and West Germany became separate republics. We go back to 1948. Germany is still occupied by the four allied forces, the United States, Great Britain and France in the western part of Germany and the Soviet Union in the eastern part of Germany. Also Berlin is similarly occupied by these four powers. In order to stop inflation, the Western Allies introduced the Deutsche Mark in the Western sectors of Germany on June 18th that year. A few days later, the Soviet zone follows with a new currency for East Germany, which is planned to also include West Berlin. The Western Allies, however, declared this decision invalid. West Berlin is not a Soviet occupation zone and therefore the Western D-Mark is also introduced in West Berlin. On June 23rd at night, suddenly the lights go out in West Berlin. 70% of the electricity in West Berlin comes from power plants in the east and the Soviets shut these plants down. On the next day, the Soviets start blocking all land routes to Berlin. The railroad connecting the city to the western zone is closed. The autobahn used by the western allies is shut down and a few days later, barge traffic into the western sectors of Berlin is stopped. The Soviets also announced that all deliveries of goods to the western sectors of Berlin from the Soviet zone of Germany and the Soviet sector of Berlin are forbidden. Control points are established on roads leading into the western sectors of Berlin. All over sudden, the Soviets have cut off the western sectors of Berlin from all sources of food and energy. Now the western allies have three options. The first option is to leave West Berlin. From a Soviet point of view, having the Western Allies leave Berlin would prove the failure of capitalism and also prove that the Western Allies cannot be trusted. The French favor this option to leave. Besides not seeing the added value of keeping Berlin, the French do not want to take a risk in a possible humiliating retreat if they will be defeated by the end. The British and American political leaders, however, unanimously agreed to stay in Berlin and that surrender is not an option. Option 2 is sending a heavily armed convoy to the West German border, forcing access to the motorway to West Berlin. US military governor General Lucius Clay, who already literally earned his stripes during the Second World War, is stationed in Germany. He's not afraid of a confrontation and as a matter of fact, he already starts getting the troops and armor together while waiting for a final decision from Washington. But his option is considered too risky. It would provoke a war and the Soviets have much more men in and around Berlin. With these incalculable consequences, all that is left is option 3, setting up an airlift. No one is convinced that this can serve as a long-term solution, supporting a city of more than 2 million people by air. But the airlift being the only alternative is seen as an intermediate solution, until the conflict with the Soviets will be solved. Maybe within a couple of weeks or so. US General Clay even speaks to the mayor of Berlin, Ernst Reuter, asking him if he thinks that the population will be prepared to live with less basic necessities such as food and coal. Reuter then says to Clay, you look after the airlift and I'll take care of the Berliners. And after talking it through with the British and agreeing that an airlift is indeed the only option, on June 26th the US Air Force officially launches the airlift under code name Operation Vittles. Three so-called air corridors in and out of Berlin were available. It had already been agreed in 1945 that the Western Allies had to use these 20 miles wide routes connecting the western parts of Germany with the western part of Berlin. If the Soviets would start shooting down the Western aircraft flying in these corridors, that would be a legitimate reason to go to war. It is rightly assumed that the use of the flight corridors for the airlift will be possible. Main responsible for the airlift are the following three US generals. Lucius Clay, he was the one who gave the orders to start the airlift. 
Curtis LeMay, the US Air Force commander in Europe, and William Tanner, who was leading the day-to-day -day operations. First of all, it's important to assess what the population of West Berlin would need to survive. The following list is created very quickly. Throughout the airlift, changes are made to these requirements. For example, it turns out that a lot of weight can be saved by carrying dehydrated potatoes and boned meat. Although transporting baked bread instead of wheat and coal sounds more efficient, it turned out that that didn't add too much value. Next to food, a lot of coal was needed for heating people's homes, for factories, but also for electric power plants. The daily requirement was estimated at 2,500 to 3,000 short tons, so between 2,300 and 2,700 metric tons. At the end, two out of every three aircraft would be transporting coal. After the requirements are set, as a second step, the aircraft and staff needs to be found. Next to the Royal Air Force and the US Air Force staff, the largest group of employees are the mostly German cargo loaders. Of a total of about 75,000 people that are needed for the airlift, around 50,000 are cargo loaders. Finding manpower is not very hard at that time, but the availability of aircraft is the limiting factor to achieve the target tonnages to be transported each day at the start of the airlift. In a short period, a fleet is built up. Some of the aircraft are very old, and most of them officially are not even cargo planes. At the peak of the airlift, the aircraft fleet consists out of 380 planes from the US and British Air Forces. On top of that come dozens of planes from about 25 British charter airlines that also participate in the airlift. The most used aircraft are the C-47 Skytrains, the freight version of the DC-3, also called Douglas Dakota, it could carry about 3 tons of cargo. The Douglas C-54 Skymaster, the freight version of the DC-4, is the most important aircraft type of the airlift. At the peak of the operation, more than 200 C-54s were transporting goods into Berlin. The plane can carry 3 to 4 times as much freight as a C-47, but needs the same time to load and unload. The Avro York is used by the Royal Air Force and can carry 9 short tons, 8 metric tons. The Handley Page Hastings can carry a bit less. One is exhibited at the Berlin Allied Museum. Also, two squadrons of Sunderland flying boats prove to be useful because at the beginning of the airlift there are only two airports in West Berlin that soon become overloaded. The Sunderland can perfectly land on the Havel River, that is, until winter comes and the river gets frozen. Next to all other supplies, there is a need of 38 tons of salt per day. If a bag of salt would start leaking during transportation, it would be a disaster, because salt is so corrosive to aircraft, and in particular to their controls. The Sunderlands, however, have been impregnated against corrosion and have their cabling in the roof and not under the cargo floor. Unloading these planes, however, proves to be a disaster, because little barges are needed to bring the cargo to the riverbank. Although larger aircraft that could carry far more than 20 tons already existed at that time, like the Douglas C-74 Globemaster, these were not used in big numbers during the airlift. First of all, because not all airports were big enough to accommodate them. Also, the runways were not constructed for their weight, and loading and unloading of the cargo did not fit in the logistic organization of the airlift. So, these types of aircraft were only used in exceptional cases. During the first few months of the airlift, the efficiency was very low. As I said earlier, around 5000 tons of food and coal are needed each day. But till the end of July 1948, on average not even 2000 tons are supplied per day. US General Tunner arrives in Berlin late July and describes the airlift as a cowboy operation. He couldn't stand the sight of aircraft standing on the ground, stating that these beasts belong up in the air. He introduces a number of principles that increase efficiency. Some of them are nowadays standard, but in the 1940s they are far from that. Here's a few of those principles. In a corridor, there is only one flight direction, reserving the upper and lower corridor for flights to Berlin and the middle corridor for flights back to West Germany considerably increases safety. Standardization of the used types of aircraft. In order to reduce complexity, 
Exotic planes were banned from the operation. Different types of aircraft have to fly at different altitudes. Takeoffs take place in 3 minute intervals and are done squadron after squadron, where each squadron consists of one type of plane and flies at its own altitude. No overtaking is necessary anymore. Quick loading and unloading. It is forbidden for air crews to be more than 10 yards away from their aircraft while it is being unloaded in Berlin. A mobile snack bar comes to each plane, providing the pilots with hot dogs, donuts and coffee. Direct return of aircraft that are facing problems. To avoid long waiting times, repair times, but also crashes in Berlin, aircraft experiencing difficulties are sent back immediately fully loaded through the center corridor. The number of sorties, which is the number of missions in aviation language, that an aircraft would fly per day would regularly be 3 to 4. The air traffic controllers needed to manage around 1000 flight movements in the West Berlin area per day. The airlift was an operation mainly executed by the United States and Great Britain. Although they cooperated on a political level, the operations were separated. They had their own airports in the west of Germany and also in West Berlin, where Tempelhof, which lies in the American zone, was operated by the US Air Force and Gato in the British zone by the Royal Air Force. Construction of a third airport, Tegel, in the French zone started in August 1948 and was finished in only three and a half months of time. It had the longest landing strip in Europe at that time of 2,400 meters, so 8,000 feet, and was used by both the US Air Force and the Royal Air Force. After the airlift was set up, at first the Soviets did not take any further action. They thought it would never work and it would not last long before the Western Allies would give up or that the West Berlin population, suffering from hunger, would start revolting. After a month or so, they still didn't see any of these two scenarios happening. So they started to convince the West Berliners to sign up for rations in East Berlin, luring them with better food and more coal. Unfortunately for the Soviets, the large number of West Berliners they hoped for did not show up. It was only several tens of thousands of them, so after trying it the nice and friendly way, they intensified the controls at the borders to West Berlin. In 1948, the borders around West Berlin were still open and a lot of West Berlin inhabitants also worked in the east and the other way around. Soviet Red Army soldiers searched trains, trams and buses that crossed the sector borders. Even pedestrians and cyclists were stopped. Inspections could end up being very humiliating. Also, the Soviet propaganda was made more aggressive by spreading the message to the West Berlin population that they'd better join the eastern side now before it's too late and that they would starve. At the same time, non-communist members of the municipal government were hindered in doing their job. This led to a huge demonstration with a crowd of hundreds of thousands of Berliners in September 1948. Ernst Reuter, the freely elected mayor of Berlin, who was not allowed to do his job by the Soviets, held a memorable speech asking the world to support Berlin. Besides the flow of goods into the city, there was also a need to transport cargoes out of Berlin. This was at first underestimated and controversial. Having also to lift cargo out of Berlin would take extra time slowing down the daily number of inbound flights, but on the other hand, flying out products produced in Berlin factories was needed to avoid that these factories would need to close down, resulting in their workers getting unemployed. It was the RAF that took responsibility for flying cargoes out of Berlin. Also, tens of thousands of people were flown out of Berlin for reasons of their safety and well-being. But also, people with a negative attitude were flown out to avoid that they would spread their pessimism amongst others. The aircraft that brought in the supplies were also referred to as raisin bombers or candy bombers. Lieutenant Gil Halverson from the US Air Force came up with the idea to drop candy out of the planes after he had met some children at the fence of the Tempelhof airport. To make sure that no one got hurt, the candy was tied to small parachutes made of handkerchiefs. More and more drops were done, but Halverson had started his operation without any approval of his superiors. But fan mail started coming in, and the drops were also headlines in the newspapers. Halverson had to report to his commanding officer, who asked him what on earth he was doing and why Halverson hadn't informed him. The conversation ended with a handshake and a smile. Halverson was allowed to keep dropping candy. 
Even General Tunner approved the operation that got its own name, Operation Little Vittles, and got big support from the people in the US, who donated tons of candy and also small handkerchiefs. So how did the blockade end? Stalin had hoped that in winter 1948-49 supplying West Berlin would get that difficult that the airlift could no longer be maintained. But apart from a couple of setbacks, by the end of January daily levels of goods supplied by air even had increased. Stalin approached the West saying that he would be open to negotiations. His conditions were that a West German state would not be founded and he needed a non-aggression pact with the Soviet Union. Negotiations between the Soviet Union and the United States started and took place in secrecy. The Western Allies did not agree in stopping the establishment of a West German state and set an end date for the blockade, the 12th of May 1949. The Soviets agreed. Although the light went on again in West Berlin and the Soviets reopened the roads at the border, this was no reason to immediately stop the airlift. There was a lack of trust, and the airlift was maintained to build up reserves to be ready for a possible next blockade. Interruptions of rail and road connections still occurred from time to time, and also electricity supply had disruptions. In the beginning of August 1949, the number of flights was reduced little by little. The very last aircraft of the airlift, a C-54, landed in Berlin on September 30th, 1949. The total number of sorties flown during the airlift is 278,000, a total of 2.3 million short tons, that's 2.1 million metric tons, was transported. With 76% of the total volume, the US Air Force transported the largest tonnage and therefore made the largest contribution to the airlift. But the Royal Air Force proved to be more efficient and transported most passengers and also flew cargo out that was produced in Berlin. Both air forces complemented each other well. Besides that, the airlift has been a catalyst for Germany in changing from a former enemy into an ally. What about the cost of the airlift? I found several numbers in different sources, varying from 224 million to 650 million US dollars, including the cost for the United States, the United Kingdom and Germany. To get a rough idea how much that would be today, just multiply by 10. 24 serious accidents were counted and 78 people have lost their lives during the airlift. For certain, the pilots that worked under very challenging circumstances are the heroes of the operation. They flew their planes just until the moment that maintenance was really necessary and in some cases also beyond that moment. They made long days, especially in the beginning of the airlift when there was less structure. They sometimes hardly had a bed to sleep on and started their next shift being tired. But also ground staff must not be forgotten, managing the tons of goods that had to be transported each day, making sure that everything went into the right direction and keeping the food dry and cool. Work at the loading ramps was extremely hard work, almost all of it had to be done manually, machines like forklift trucks were scarce. Since the Berlin airlift, dozens of other airlifts have taken place all over the world. But the Berlin airlift remains the largest and most successful. Even the volume carried by all these later airlifts together is still less than that of the Berlin airlift alone. The Berlin airlift will always remain a unique piece of history of Berlin and an important chapter in the history of the Cold War. That's it for today. Thanks for watching and hope to see you again on the next video.